Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Thursday afternoon Innovative Business Advisors webinar. So today, while we had promised that we might have a guest speaker, we're not going to bring the guest on board because uh, as uh, we have learned over time, uh, the SBA can be quite uh, uh, prone to change. So we did end up getting a fair amount of change again this week, and we are going to once again focus on the changes that occurred uh, over the course of the last seven days uh, relative to uh, the various uh, COVID uh, response uh, programs that are available to us. So with that said, I see that some people are sending us notes in the chat box already. What we prefer is that if you see the Q&A box at the bottom and you want to communicate with the panelists, go ahead and type into the Q&A box. That way we can actually capture your comments and share them. So after this webinar is completed, we will uh, upload a copy of the recording to our YouTube site and any PowerPoint slides or any other documents that we reference during this will be loaded to our Google Docs file, which will be referenced from the YouTube site. So know that you don't have to take notes, that it will all be available to you. Again, I've already told you our topic and you can see Steve's agenda on the screen. So Steve, take it away. Great. Thank you, Markita. Thanks so much again for giving us these Thursday afternoons. We're very appreciative. So uh, Markita's right. We, uh, we had a guest scheduled for you this week. We uh, we asked them if they would uh, postpone so that we could spend some time covering the changes that have occur occurred since the last time we were together, and they have graciously agreed to do so. So we'll, we will be back to you in upcoming webinars with uh, some very interesting uh, guests. Looking forward to that. Um, we're going to start today and talk a little bit about the SBA loan program overview again. We had a pretty deep dive on that last week, so you can find that webinar on our YouTube channel if you've got any particular questions. And of course, we received several questions over the course of the last week, so that's why we wanted to uh, take the time to cover a couple of the high points again. Uh, in addition to that, there have been a lot of changes in the PPP program over the last week, so we're, we're gonna walk through each of those and make sure the audience is well-equipped in those areas. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program. Um, we were hopeful that it would open up uh, this week. It still hasn't opened up. Um, you know, who knows? We'll see maybe again next week. But the SBA has got a lot of change going on. So, frankly, I'm, I'm not too surprised in that regard. But um, with that said, let me just get to the control panel here and we'll move in to the rest of the presentation here. So, fascinating. Uh, I, Marquita and I were joking earlier, I think the SBA must have watched our, uh, our webinar last week because they came out with this uh, really nice graphic overview, very similar to what we had produced last week, made me laugh when I saw it, uh, but it's actually excellent. It is here for your reference. We, we will, of course, have it um, as a downloadable document uh, in the replay portal, so it's available to you. But just to confirm, if, um, if you didn't see this last week, basically what's happening here is the SBA has determined that they are potentially not going to have enough funds to cover all of the the free payments that were promised under the Economic Aid Act. So they have said that depending upon when you may have had an SBA loan taken out, um, there's going to be a, a reduced payment amount available. The first section of uh, this graph talks about loans that were approved before March 27th of 2020. So typically um, loans that were in place in those areas. And uh, many folks received six months of payments already. And then there was to be a second round of, of potential payments as well. And uh, this box details all of those. When you get into the yellow, it talks about businesses in underserved markets, and we'll cover that in just a second. So the first two columns are related to those folks that had SBA loans prior to March 27th. The middle boxes are related to those that took out loans between March 27th and September 27th of last year. And in those situations, the SBA did make payments for those particular borrowers, um, but they were not eligible for second round payments. 
we talked before about uh, the poor folks that were in this uh, in this in this squeeze area. Those that had taken out an SBA loan between September 28th and um, January 31st of this year, they were not eligible for any uh, payments made on their behalf. So. I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's a round of folks that um, took out loans during that period that are not particularly happy with that, and then the SBA is projecting that for those borrowers that anticipate taking out an SBA loan from February 1st of this year through the end of September this year that there will be at least three months of those payments available, and remember all of those payments are capped at about nine thousand dollars per month, so. Had lunch with a client of ours this morning who actually had a couple of SBA loans and uh, they were able to take advantage of that and get the full nine thousand dollars. So it's it is it is a nice benefit for uh, for companies that apply. We talked a little bit of, a few minutes ago about the underserved marketplace. The um, Congress in its wisdom identified several industrial classification codes that were considered to be underserved businesses, meaning that they were disproportionately affected by uh, this pandemic that we've been going through. And they are the SBA is now anticipating that those underserved businesses will receive approximately three months of payments versus the, the law, which had authorized up to five months of payments. So you can see those particular industrial classifications here. And, um, you know, I think without question, all of those various uh, various entities were severely affected over the course of the last year. So just wanted to make sure that uh, our audience was well informed about that. To touch base on some of the additional terms, again, they, the Economic Aid Act adjusted the guarantee up to 90%. There were various levels of guarantees in the past. All the loans are now adjusted up to 90% and they have eliminated the, uh, the fee adjustments retroactive to loans that were approved after December 27th. So um, there are no fees associated with the various SBA products right now as well, which is a pretty significant savings. The other thing that uh, they've just come out and said in regards to the SBA loans is that there were situations where um, potentially borrowers may have received 1099 miscellaneous, um, but um, all of those are being corrected. And if in fact you received one of those in the past, they're sending out new ones so that uh, you will not have to file uh, miscellaneous income, record the income and thus then pay a tax on that income um, on your 2020 return. So SBA is making those adjustments and taking care of that stuff. So that pretty well covers us on the existing SBA loan programs. We're going to spend basically the rest of our time together today talking about the PPP program and all of the various changes that have come into play. So I thought I'd ground us with um, where are we in terms of the PPP program? And this is information that just came out uh, on Monday of this week. So brand new information. The PPP right now, if you look down at the bottom, the summary of 2021 PPP approved lending is uh, over 140 billion. We're, we're just over the halfway mark on that. So we had said early on, we had predicted that potentially this program could run out of funds by the end of March. Um, there looks like that could be a real possibility. We'll see. So uh, at this point in time, um, it's, I would say by anybody's measure, it's been, uh, it's been pretty popular. A couple of million loans approved. So um, quite astounding when you think about there are in essence 30 million small businesses in the United States and to date over 7 million of those have received some form of a PPP loan. Uh, so um, I think um, we have to look back and say this is, this is something that um, certainly was quite popular within the small business ownership community and uh, probably something that um, was, was very, very needed and um, 
quite innovative of our federal legislatures to come up with something like this that had never been done before. We don't often hear about government innovating and, and trying new things. This was a, this was a real positive, uh, I think, from almost every measure. So that'll give us a little bit of grounding on where they where we stand today. And then um, I also wanted to, I pulled this down from the SBA's deck for a particular reason. And you're gonna see in a minute as we go through some of the changes, this will help explain some of that. So the big thing that I'd like to call your attention to is look at, look at these columns where they're talking about first draw loans in the low uh, and uh, moderate income markets. These are the smallest of small businesses in the uh, economically disadvantaged marketplaces. And what's happened here is Congress certainly has a real focus on those particular markets. And I think they heard an overwhelming cry from the smallest of small business saying, we don't feel like, um, we, don't feel like we got a fair shake in the first round. So they're, they're making several changes to address that now in this second round. And um, by all measures, it seems to be working. So if you look at the second draw loans, you know, there are roughly twice as many loans um, that are currently approved. And we're gonna talk about several changes that are in place to continue to help that marketplace. So if you are a business that is, you know, on the small end of small businesses, um, Congress has definitely heard you and is trying to do everything they can to, um, to make this program accessible for you. So pretty nice to be able to see what's actually happening and, um, and they're doing a good job of getting good information out in a, in a pretty timely basis. So let's talk about some of the coming changes. So we received a, a communication as, as did all the lenders throughout the country on uh, Monday of this week of a series of pending changes for the, the Paycheck Protection Program. And we're gonna walk through those for you. The first change that actually went into effect yesterday is they created an exclusivity period for applications. So they've designated the, the period from February 24th to March 9th um, as a period where they're only gonna take applications from companies that have less than 20 employees uh, and 20 employees is counted by full-time, part-time, and seasonal workers. So you, if you are a company that fits within that category, now's the right time to be in line because they're, they're not taking applications from any other companies. As a matter of fact, they've come out and said, if applications come in from any company that has more than 20 employees, then they, um, then they will be rejected and they'll, uh, they'll have to reapply after, uh, this period ends, which is effect, effectively March 10th. So that's a pretty significant change. Um, I don't think there was a lot of uh, forewarning on this. Uh, so, you know, many of the banks that, um, that I've talked with in the past couple of days, um, there's a lot of comments about the changes that are going on, as you'll see as we walk through these, but there wasn't, I don't think, a lot of forewarning about this. So I don't know how widely uh, banks have been able to share with their customer base that this is in play. But I would ask our audience, if you're aware of businesses that, um, are interested in participating in the PPP program and maybe haven't yet, um, now's their time, particularly if they're on the small end of, of small, i.e. 20 employees or less for their businesses. This is a particular period of time where, uh, where Congress is, or not Congress, but the SBA and the administration has set these things aside uh, specifically for the small businesses. Yeah. And so for the clarification, Steve, on that, uh, Theoretically, banks could still accept the uh, applications, but they would have to queue them. So SBA is the point of control, right, for this uh, 20 or fewer apps coming into the SBA portal only. So hopefully our banks are actually accounting for that and they're queuing uh, the, the, the applications with larger uh, numbers of employees. Would, would that be a, a correct assumption? I, I think you're right, Marquita, and I think that's only smart on behalf of the banks as well. So what Marquita is referring to is a there is a two-step process where you make 
the application with the bank and the bank then has to turn around and take your application and and physically type it into the SBA system and so yes um, you're probably saying that banks are probably holding those applications aside and only keying in applications that uh, are for companies of 20 employees or less and and I think that's probably what's happening yeah so pretty big change in that regard the, the next big change is they've made an adjustment for Schedule C filers. So who is a Schedule C filer? Schedule C filer is anybody that is a, um, a sole proprietor or a single member LLC. They would typically be the big categories that would utilize Schedule C tax return filing for their business. And they, they have now revised that formula and they're going to be using the gross amount from line seven of the Schedule C. So I'll, we'll pull one of those uh, forms up in just a second and take a look at that and make sure everybody is well grounded on what that means. And then um, the White House has also said that they're going to set aside $1 billion of, um, of borrowing capability for Schedule C filers that have no employees. So, you know, you're talking about a, an independent contractor, generally a, a you know, sole proprietor, if, if you will, in that regard. Um, and for those that have no employees and are located in, in the lower um, market areas um, regarding uh, physical location uh, of their business. So again, they're doing a, a special set aside of a billion dollars worth of lending just to help um, solopreneurs, if you will, in that regard. So when we say line seven of Schedule C, what does that mean? Well, you pull your, pull your 2020 tax return, line seven is the total gross income of the uh, of the business so before they were talking about uh, and i think they used primarily line one but um, i think we're now in a, a position where line seven is the controlling line of your tax return that determines uh, your eligibility to participate and when you're talking about a second draw remember you're, you've got to be measuring the quarter by quarter difference. So in order to be eligible for a second draw, you had to have a 25% or more drop in revenue from quarter to quarter. So um, you'll, need to, you'll need to break up that line seven by quarterly comparisons and be able to uh, put that onto your application form. And we'll get into the specifics of that in just a few minutes as well. Okay, so next big change. Um, this this is this is going to be very large and uh, potentially controversial. Uh, Marquita, you've been in banking almost your whole career, and um, what they have now done is eliminate what's considered a restriction on SBA lending. So, if you have a prior non-fraud related felony conviction you are now eligible for PPP loans. And the SBA, at, at least as far back as I can remember, Marquita, if you had a felony conviction of any type, you were automatically disqualified from the SBA program. So this is a, this is a pretty significant um, um, change. And um, I've talked to several bankers about this, and I know that many banks have a policy of not doing commercial lending for folks that have felony convictions. Um, so they've said, you know, it's, it, if you have a non-fraud felony conviction, you may, you may be applicable, uh, but it's got to be non-fraud related in the last five years. But if you are currently, currently incarcerated, um, you are uh, you are not eligible. So, uh, Marquita, any comments on that area? Oh, I have huge comments, and and God, don't let me get political because <laughs> I can become political on this this topic. But uh, where this is going, obviously, is many of these felony con convictions are drug related convictions that are no longer crimes. They were crimes in the past. So what happened when some of the laws changed, especially around 
certain, oh God, don't let me go into my, my, my drugs, certain uh, kinds oh, of cocaine ma ma yeah, and marijuana, yeah. certain kinds of co cocaine and marijuana, which were considered felonies at one point in the past are no longer um, uh, uh, felony convictions. But the people who were charged in the past never had the felonies dropped. That was not retroactive. So there's a huge, uh, huge, there, there is a population of people out there who have served their time and uh, uh, really in today's day would not have been convicted. And I think that this is some of what's happening with uh, what we call the, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, it's not the term social justice isn't the right term, but it is the imprisonment uh, uh, changes that are coming in right now is, is to not only not make these crimes going forward, but to retroactively make people, put people in a position where they can interact. There's so many things you can't do with a record. So that's a big part of it. And, and I'm happy to see it, honestly. Um, I, I, I really think that given, you know, but, but time, you know, and, and when the crime occurred or when it was a crime, it would not be a crime today. And I think that's what they're hitting at here. The non-fraud felony convictions of a large population of that is drug-related. Yeah, I think you're right. I think particularly, you know, for some of the some of the marijuana crimes and things like that. I mean, we've all we've all seen mm -hmm. those situations where folks may have been, um, you know, had that earlier in their lives in college or whatever, and uh, you know, later in their life have got a business and and find those restrictions in place. So um, there's definitely going to be some level of justice, and I think there's unfortunately going to be some level of um, some level of you know, potentially people, um, you know, falling through the cracks too. So I would imagine there's probably going to be a little bit of, of good and bad in this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but the key question is, you know, in your banking experience, um, do you have a, do you have an opinion about how banks are going to react to this? Cause I'm, I'm hearing a wide, a wide range of opinions right now. Well, you know, from where I sat in the banking wor world, we tended to look at law and we followed the law. So if this is allowable and it isn't law so much as it is the, the, the rules or if you will, the, the framework of the SBA lending, if, if SBA says it's allowable um, as a bank, we would have accepted it, okay? Now, in other situations, perhaps not. Uh, not an SBA guaranteed loan. We may have looked at it differently if we held a loan in portfolio. But for an SBA loan, uh, uh, if it's, you know, if, if SBA limit, uh, lifts this restriction, uh, banks that I was with in the past would have simply said, yes, it's, it's covered. It's, we've got the guarantee. Yeah, and I think particularly as we think about, you know, this right now applies solely to PPP loans. Um, I don't believe that this is covered for all SBA lending, but it's certainly for PPP loans. And um, Which are generally think, forgivable. Right. And the banks are not doing underwriting on PPP loans. Mm -hmm. So generally, they just have to accept the application. The, the, the lenders are through. kind of servicers, if you will. Yeah. 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 So it is a little bit of a special situation, but... Um, but boy, I, when I first saw this, I was like, "Wow!" I I, I was surprised that this uh, that this level of change actually took place. So, if you thought that was controversial, where do you see the next one? So, the next thing they've done is that they've said, if you have a student loan delinquency, uh, you can now get a PPP loan, right? So. Um, and that is that applies to any owner that has 20% or more ownership within the business. So um, this is um, this is a big change as well. And I think their the student loan delinquencies is certainly a a uh, a fact that is growing within the uh, within our populations, right? So yeah. pretty significant. And another one, you know, from from where I sit, I I totally. I totally support this because when you look at a person's creditworthiness and you look at student loan delinquency as a component of that, 
you have to think in the context of what has COVID done and do we have an incremental people who have gone delinquent on student loans because they lost a job or whatever happened during, during COVID. Um, so the question becomes, or did the business, is the business unable to allow them enough funds to cover their student loans? So you see, you see how, how, you know, generally politically, Steve, I tend to lean in a direction that says, you know, let's have some grace for these people. What has happened to them in, in, in their uh, lot in life is not all tied to them being bad people or people you can't trust. A lot of it is uh, in an indication of a, a, a series of circumstances that they've been through. And I want to talk more about that when we get to Schedule C, because I've got a whole series of stories around Schedule C and what's allowed in, in that component of the PPP uh, comp uh, available amount for um, for the loan. Yeah, it's it's fascinating on the student loan side. I mean, we've seen in, in our company, we've seen so many people that um, have student loans, not necessarily delinquencies, but just have these huge, huge student levels loans. of student loans that completely restricts their borrowing capability when they go to either expand their business or, or potentially to start or buy a new business. So uh, it you know, the, the growth of student loans is something that, um, you know, was federally enabled in my view, but uh, it's, it's, it's been relatively uh, huge, the impact that it's had, particularly on small business. So again, this, this relates specifically to PPPs. Um, banks typically, if you've got a student loan delinquency and, rem, rem, you know, are, are, our audience needs to remember that student loan delinquencies are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. It's the only type of, uh, of loan that you can't discharge. It stays with you for life under the current law, right? And um, if you have that delinquency, obviously it, it hurts you from a credit rating perspective. And for banks that are doing underwriting, I'm sure that's a significant, um, a significant barrier that they, they have to cover with the borrower. Um, but under a PPP scenario, a bank is not doing underwriting. They're just basically forwarding the information to the SBA. And in, in this instance, the White House has said that um, the small business, the small business administration is going to take on the risk. Yeah. So, pretty significant. But it does apply to the owners of the business, obviously. So, you know, we're talking about the owner of a of a business that's typically applying for for a PPP. Okay, so we've we've had two controversial changes. We uh, we have another to discuss. The other thing is they've come out and now said under the White House initiative that you, if you are a non-citizen owner of a business, um, you are now eligible for a PPP as well. So again, a non-citizen, but they've put a couple of caveats on there. They said, first off, you do have to be a lawful US resident. Uh, I think the devil's gonna be in the details on a lot of these things. We're gonna have to see what the fine print looks like. We don't have a lot of, the, the guidelines on that. And the SBA has come out and said that next week they will be distributing a lot more detail about that. So we will have that. Um, but again, you have to be, you can be a non-citizen, but you have to be a lawful U.S. resident and you do have to have an individual taxpayer identification number. And my understanding is that uh, these typically begin with a nine. So, so Marquita, what, is it, what does that um, bring to mind when you think about these changes? Okay, so you and I are very aware of a path to residency that has to do with purchasing a business. So people who are not U.S. citizens have the uh, ability to buy a business in the United States, run and operate that business, and over a period of time, they have a path to citizenship, which is different from a person who doesn't own a business. And I think this is aimed at that population of people. Steve, I don't remember, it's a specific program. There is a very specific uh, program. Immigrant visa programs, yeah. Yeah, aimed at, at uh, owning a business as your path to citizenship. And that's who I think this is aimed at and absolutely agree because they're, they're legit um, U.S. businesses in many instances, these people have purchased those businesses from U.S. citizens. And so they are facing the exact same issue that the person who owned it prior to them uh, would have faced. And uh, you would hope that the PPP loan process would support their business as much as it uh, would have uh, the, the, pre the previous owners uh, uh, running of that business. 
Yeah, you're you're so right about that. And that's, um, you know, when you look at from a hotel and motel perspective in this mm -hmm. country, the largest percentage of uh, hotels and motels are owned by Indians, people of Indian ancestry, right? It's the largest group of Southeast owners mm -hmm. in the uh, in the country. So mm -hmm. it's fascinating. And when you think about hotels, motels, accommodations, if you will, and food services, I'm sure there is a lot of people that are uh, of various potentially non-citizen status within the within the ownership ranks of the food service. Yeah, uh, but they're all on a path. They're on a path to citizenship. They just haven't achieved it yet. Yeah, this takes time. Yeah, the way the immigration laws are set up in the United States, if you can come in and buy a business or start a business and you've got specific amounts of capital that you've got to deploy, and depending upon the types of businesses, it could be as much as half a million dollars. So, I mean, it, it is a way to kind of go to the head of the line on the immigration standpoint and get and earn your green card, if you will. But you do so by, by making significant investments in the country. So pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty amazing changes, I would say. Some, some big some big differences one more uh one more key thing and this is more i think administrative than anything else they they uh you know as i was thinking about this earlier it seems like um it seems like the bureaucrats have always got to tinker with things around the edges, right? So now we have a new application. We have an updated application for, for the PPP programs, for either the first draw and the second draw. So there's a whole new application form again. Uh, and here we are um, with an application dated February 17th. Um, they're asking for more demographic information and their their um, intent here is to try and really get higher response rates on these. So it looks like when you were looking at some of the information that the SBA had provided, I wasn't sure whether they just didn't get good information uh, from the applications or whether it was the fact that the demographic information is optional on the applications and you know, either banks didn't key it in or, or applicants elected not to fill in those boxes. So I'm gonna uh, take a couple of minutes and uh, we've, we've dropped in the new application. So show you exactly what it, what it says. Uh, I know a lot of our listeners are probably uh, through a first draw. So I, I elected to pull the second draw borrower application form. So you can see up at the top, uh, that's what the title is. And you can see that it's revised as of February 17th, 2021. So the, the top is basically the same as it always was. You always had to put in your, your uh, DBA or your trade name. You always had to put the year that your business was established, the name, et cetera, and the various codes. Um, the middle section where you put in your average monthly payroll amount, uh, and then multiply that by either 2.5 or 3.5. That was that was common with the other one. Um, what is new is the next section where you're talking about the purpose of the loan. So I would it'd be interesting, Marquita, to see if anybody checks boxes, you know, and doesn't check the payroll cost box. Mm -hmm. So you know, for a, a paycheck protection program, I think uh, it's almost automatic. You have to check the payroll box. I would I would imagine. And then if you did have the first draw PPP, you do have to put in that loan number. And then the, the lower box is where you reference which particular quarter the revenue difference of your business was 25% or more. So as you can see, you have to identify which quarter Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and then you have to detail the actual receipts to uh, to determine the difference. So um, much, much different format in that regard. So we went to this, we, we started with this very simple form, fill in, fill in three or four boxes, sign your name. Now these forms seem to grow over time as this yeah. program uh, begins to take on a life of its own. Yeah. So that's the top of the form. The middle of the form is a lot of this demographic information. So you've always had to list uh, the owners of the business. Um, if there were owners that had uh, 25, tw excuse me, a 20% interest or larger, you always had to put that in. Now, um, now they've put in this full uh, demographic uh, detail and you can see 
how that shakes out and the particular information that they're looking for. And there is another new section. So there is a page two to this thing. And uh, there are these eight questions that are up there. So, uh, and again, it says up top, if you, know, if you answer one, two, four or five and the yes, you're automatically disqualified. So uh, these are the questions related to what we had talked about before. If you're presently suspended, disbarred, you know, proposed for disbarment, et cetera. Uh, if you've got, um, you know, any um, um, delinquent or defaulted loans in the past. Uh, so, you know, this is a whole new section of representations. And um, that, uh, that'll cover kind of the change in the form program, if you will. So here we are again, Marquita, another week of, uh, another week of changes in changes, the, in the you PPP bet. program. You bet. You bet. But if I could for a minute, Steve, go back to the issue with the Schedule C. Yep. And I'm speaking primarily for a, a single member LLC um, that really does not have employees within the company. Um, when we did the initial uh, PPP offering back in the spring, it was essentially based on line seven at that point in time. When instructions came out this time, because I did apply, I have a single, uh, a, a single member LLC. We actually went to the bottom of the Schedule C and took, uh, you know, divide the bottom line number, the net that you carry to your personal uh, tax return, divide by 12, multiply by two and a half, which actually came out in my case to about half of what I got in the first draw. So my second draw was about half. Now with this change, my second draw, will, it, 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 it'll be less, but it, it won't be half. And I know that there are many, many businesses that are sole, proprietor, sole proprietorships or, or single member LLCs that do have substantial expenses and, and bring a small amount of money to the bottom line. So what this will allow them to do is it will more appropriately be reflective of revenue, not so much net profit, you know, net profit uh, at the bottom line. And that gives them a bigger opportunity. I'm betting you that a lot of people just simply didn't apply. My daughter is one for sure. She didn't apply. Her number came out so low. She, she runs a fitness business. And a big part of her business is leasing space. Mm. And um, so her bottom line, and she's a single single member LLC also, you know, her bottom line amounts to very little because she lives to pay rent. <laughs> you know, she lives yep. to run the studio, so to speak. Yep. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, with this, she really gets to move up and look at her gross. And, and that makes a huge difference in her ability to participate in the program uh, versus looking at her net, which is uh, approaching zero. Yeah. So if you're an independent contractor, let's say you're a 1099 employee and mm -hmm. you're going to, you're going to use a, you know, schedule C to report your income. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a lot of expenses, if you're, you know, maybe you have a home office deduction, maybe you have some car expenses or some other things, you're absolutely right. It's going to, it's going to change that, uh, that denominator mm -hmm. that you get to use to multiply by two and a half to mm -hmm. get to what you're eligible for yeah. from a loan perspective. So this will help a lot of people, I think. I, I think, and we know so many small businesses. You know, they live to pay rent. <laughs> That's why I can call they live to pay rent. <laughs> oh, yes, they do. Lifestyle businesses, we yeah. call those, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, lots of those. So yeah, it's a it's a it is a big change because you you're not deducting any of the expenses out of the business. You're yeah. in, so instead it's of the near. net profit number, you're actually using the gross, gross income, income number. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be good. So uh, I, I would guess we'll probably see as we begin to watch the numbers come in from the PPV program, probably the uh, the loan amounts will go up a little bit, particularly for the LMI community. And uh, hopefully the number of loans will, you know, accelerate because uh, it does appear that they were, un, you know, underrepresented, if you will, in the past. Yeah. 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 So. Pretty good. Well, lots of changes. Again, elimination of uh, restrictions across the board. First is for non-fraud felony convictions. 
Um, if you have a student loan delinquency and thought uh, and were even told before that because of that you were not eligible for PPP, now now you are. So now you can go get that first draw, or you know um, I would say it probably has to apply to the first draw. You probably were not able to get a first draw in the past. So that may make you eligible for that now. And then for the non-citizen owners, and there, there are a significant amount of industries, particularly in, in accommodation and food services, where I agree with you, Marquita, I think this is going to be a, a really important change. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, the, uh, the whole updated application in terms of the demographic stuff. So lots to look at there. We're going to put the application forms in the, in the recording portal as well. So they'll be there. Um, also had a couple of questions came in this week, and I just wanted to restress on the uh, Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. Key qualifications, you had to be in business um, on February 29th. Key thing here, um, you cannot apply and receive PPP after 1227 and then also apply for the shuttered venue operators grant and the SBA did a nice thing they put a they put a little eligibility matrix up which I'm going to I'm going to pull up and share in just a second as well um, and then documentation you know we had talked about there are still it's a little nebulous on exactly what they're going to require they haven't posted all of it this is specifically some of the things they're asking for what we do know for sure is that you are going to have to register in the SAM system which is the government system and in order to do so you must have a DUNS number so I had a couple of questions come in this week how do I get a DUNS number right where do I where do I go to find out if I even have a DUNS number um, so I wanted to bring the link into this as well. So you can go to this link and determine with Dun & Bradstreet whether you have a DUNS number already. And if you don't, you can apply for one very quickly and, uh, and receive that. And then you can take that and go into the SAM system and um, put in your business information so you are a registered SAM user doesn't cost anything but you got to go in take the time and put the information in and and get your SAM number if you will which will then become part of your application process when the shuttered venue operators grant finally opens up so here's that uh, that nice little matrix that I talked about this is directly from the SBA and it's um, it just shows you that you know if, if you were a first draw PPP borrower um, you may apply for the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant uh, if you receive the PPP loan before December 27th. If, if it was afterwards, you may not. So um, just a little, uh, a little short matrix that'll help you determine which programs may be available to you if you fall within that, uh, that uh, Performing Arts Venue Operators uh, classification code, if you will. So that's it for us this week, Marquita. Um, get back to our resources page. Uh, lots of things available out there to you. You can find our contact information there for Marquita and myself if you have any questions or, um, or you know, would like to engage us and have uh, further discussions. You can do so by reaching out to us through the Innovative BA website. Uh, or any of the social media channels. We have we have pages and all those channels. Of course, you know, our YouTube channel is where we host all of our replays. And um, we do have uh, the, uh, the book portals available. If you're interested in learning more about uh, buying and selling a business, we've got now two titles to choose from on our portal. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about our coaching programs, you can go to ceo to ceo.coach and learn a little bit more about that as well, which is a, a new site up this week as well. So with that, Marquita, I want to say thank you very much for your time again this week. Appreciate the, uh, the dedication of that and certainly the engagement. Your insight is always so powerful. Yeah, and, and I'm looking here. We have no questions right now, so it looks like we have an opportunity to end early to not today. Uh, you know, the last comment I'd like to make is, you know, as we look through these changes, nothing gives me heartburn here. And I suspect for most of our audience, uh, and we, we've come to know our audience uh, over the course of the last, you know, nine months or so that we've been doing this program. I don't think these changes 
will affect you very much. It's just that it makes the, the loan program more inclusive for, for, for people who may not have been a part of uh, the program in the past. So it, it all appears good to me. Uh, you know, with, with that said, I think for most of us, this would not have had a major impact except for those people who may have been single owner LLCs or sole proprietorships who have a good outcome too because they have a different number, a larger number potentially that they'll be able to apply to that PPP loan uh, specifically. So with that said, Steve, I'm going to give it to you for the last words and you can close us down. All right. Well, I would say the key takeaway this week is particularly if you are, you know, the smallest of the small business, if you're a solopreneur or if you are a, a very small business with just a couple of employees, or if you're a business that is operating in one of these lower, um, lower income areas, boy, uh, and you thought that the PPP program wasn't for you as uh, your example, Marquita, of your daughter, I think is, mm -hmm. is really a pro, apropos here. If you took a look at it and said, it's just not worth my time and effort because I'm going to get so little, mm -hmm. these changes may have a significant impact for you. So um, it might be worth the time to, uh, to invest uh, your time and take another look at this and see if, in fact, these programs are now going to add some real value for you. So I'm with you. I think, um, I think it is designed to help those that uh, probably need the help the most. And, uh, and hopefully this, these program changes will begin to reach that audience. So again, thank you so much for the time, Marquita. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your stewardship of these and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. We'll see everyone next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.